Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you all. Uh, I, I'm sorry I can't do it in Chinese, uh, uh, but I hope it won't be too much of a barrier to understanding. I've put the note, I've put the URL for the slides into the Zoom chat if you would like to download the slides and look at them later or follow along with what I'm doing. Okay, so I will start off by uh, explaining what Tupcat is and what it can do. Uh, and then the second half of the talk will be doing some demonstrations. Um, so I'll put it through its paces and show you how you can come up with some actually interesting scientific results. I'll be using data from the Gaia astrometry satellite to do that mostly. Uh, and then there'll be some time for some questions at the end if anyone has any. So Topcat is a, a desktop application uh, for working with tabular data. That usually means source catalogues, but it can be other kinds of tables as well. And it's good for both looking at a table that you haven't seen before and just getting a rough idea of what data is in there, what columns there are, uh, making uh, small plots, but also uh, for doing really in-depth analysis. So trying to understand uh, and extract all the, astronomy, all the uh, astronomically interesting information that's in that table. And its basic job is to do all the uh, boring mechanical things that astronomers need to do with tabular data. So understanding external file formats and uh, visualization and cross matching and moving columns around and doing calculations so that you, the astronomer, can understand, concentrate on, on doing the actual astronomy rather than the boring mathematical stuff. Just a little bit of history and, and context. Um, I've been working on TopCat since about 2003. It's not the only thing I've been doing, but it's uh, it's been the bulk of my work since then. And it's been funded by uh, various different people. It's not um, been part of a single astronomical project. I've hopped from different funding streams uh, in that time. Mostly it's been funded by um, what's now the STFC, which is the UK um, funding agency for astronomical research, but there have been other organisations as well. And some of those associated with the Virtual Observatory, which is a, a buzzword you may have heard. I'll talk a bit about that later on. Um, and TopCat sometimes described as a, a virtual observatory tool, which it is. It talks well to other uh, services and other tools that work within the Virtual Observatory, but it's not just that. You can work with local data as well. Uh, it's currently got just about a thousand citations in the literature. That's a graph there of how it looks. So you can see it's taken a while to get up to speed um, for people to, to know that the software is there and start using it, but it is well acknowledged now. Um, and about 700 different uh, internet addresses use it every day. Uh, so I, it's difficult to interpret that as an exact number of users, but a few thousand active users, I think at least. It runs on Java on the desktop, which means it's easy to, for me to distribute. I just need to prepare one file and I don't need to worry about different operating systems. Um, it runs pretty much without further intervention um, or further builds. It's all open source, so you can look at the source code on uh, GitHub there and download it and, and look at it yourself and build it if you like. Um, as far as development goes, it's really just me. It's not a project with lots of people. Um, which obviously means there's a limited amount of manpower available, but it does make things easier in terms of project management. I don't have to um, hold meetings with myself and do complicated communications. I decide what needs to get done uh, and do the documentation, and the testing and the implementation uh, and the distribution and everything. Um, and so a lot of that is trying to work out what features I should add into the software. Um, and there's various ways that I do that. I don't have a particularly complicated issue management software. I, I get emails from people and try to understand what work astronomers are doing with it and then try to predict what are going to be the most useful uh, features to add into it in future. And I very much encourage user involvement. So I like to speak to users, um, getting uh, requests for things that it ought to do or uh, bug reports or queries about how to do something uh, is really helpful to get an idea of how people are using the software and, and what I should do to it to make it more useful. The aims, um, so I try to make it user friendly. Um, that's easier to, to say than to do. Um, but the things that I try to concentrate on are to make it easy to install and run because it's in Java. It means uh, you can just download one file and if you have Java, it should run pretty straightforwardly. Um, 
it can do a lot of complicated things, but the idea is that if you want to do something simple with it, it should be quite easy. So if you just want to look at the data in the table, look at the columns and rows, um, you just click one button. Um, if you just want to do a plot, a simple scatter plot of, of two columns against each other, that should be pretty simple. And you can do much more complicated things and you have to work progressively harder to understand how to do those things. Um, but everything is at least completely documented. And so there's a comprehensive uh, user document which explains how to do everything. Um, there's a lot of effort to make it work fast. Um, so it handles quite large tables. If you have millions of rows and hundreds of columns, that's fine even on any old desktop or laptop. You don't need a, a fast machine, particularly to work with fairly large amounts of data. If you have a fast machine, lots of cores, lots of memory, you can work with tens or, or maybe even hundreds of millions of rows. Uh, and that's improving as time goes on in recent versions, and I'll be making a new release very soon. Um, it's working better with multi-core machines. So there's more parallelism, more multi-threading. So if you have a machine with multiple cores, it should do various things faster and that's improving. Um, and the main thing that I try to do with it is to make it do the kinds of jobs that astronomers need to do. I don't want me to be deciding, oh, it should do this, it should do that. It's all informed by the feedback I get from people like you, uh, astronomers who are using it and, uh, and me understanding the kinds of ways they're working and try to make their lives easier. I'll go through on the following slides various different things it can do and then I'll show you some examples of those. Um, so I won't go through this list of, of things that it can do in detail, but I'll just mention things that it can't do. So it's a program for tables. Uh, it's It won't do anything. You can't feed it image data. Uh, use different programs for that. Um, and for things like spectra, well, if a spectrum looks like a table, which they uh, sometimes do, then you can load the spectral data into it. But there's no specifically spectral uh, uh, functionality in there. Um, and that's because it's kind of complicated enough already in terms of functionality. And I don't want to spend a lot of effort um, may, if, if I try to add more things um, to do with, with spectra and time series then it just becomes more complicated to use for the table. So I try to stick to the core uh, mission of working with, with catalog data. You can't script Topcat, you can just point and click, but there's an associated package, Stilts, which I'll talk very briefly about later, uh, which you can do scripting, uh, programmatic uh, control of it. Um, there is a limit to how large the tables it will work with. You probably can't load a billion row tables into it. Uh, but again, Stilts is capable of working with larger tables, if that's what you want to do. There, uh, It won't work with all external file formats. There's half a dozen that it does work with, FITS and VO table and CSV and ECSV and some others. Um, but you may have file formats that it won't work with, so you might need to prepare those in some other uh, tool before feeding them to Topcat. And Importantly, it won't do your astronomy for you. It won't write your astronomy papers. Um, it does the, the mechanical things and you have to think about how to turn that into, into something that's really uh, meaningful in scientific terms. Okay, so uh, it can the, the most basic thing it can do is look at table data and table metadata. And so uh, when you load a table in, you can scroll around with the rows and columns and see what the numbers and, uh, and values in there are. But you can also look at the metadata of the tables. And that may be uh, not so important if you're looking at a table that you've prepared yourself, for instance, a source extraction, uh, you know what the columns are uh, and you, you don't need extra information on those. But if you're looking at a table which you've downloaded from an external catalog service, which may have hundreds of columns in it, um, it's really important to be able to understand what those columns mean. And so this window, the the table columns window will tell you not only the, the column names, but also uh, the units and, and maybe a human readable description of what those columns are. Uh, of course, only if whoever prepared the table has put that information in there. Uh, so that can be useful. One of the things that allows you to do a lot of work in understanding the data is to make row selections. And so if you've got a large catalogue, you want to understand what the subpopulations of the objects uh, represented in there are. And there are various different ways that you can identify these. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of these. You can draw uh, a shape around uh, a visualisation. And so you can say, I'm interested in these objects and not these objects. 
And then you can go on to use that selection in other contexts, for instance, make other plots uh, uh, and see where those objects lie in the other plots. Uh, there are other ways you can do it as well. You can use an expression uh, in the algebraic expression language that it has to identify a set of objects. Um, and uh, you can do something similar like this, which is like drawing a shape, but you get a, uh, an algebraic expression explaining what, uh, defining what that region of the plot is. And so once you've, you've identified these selections, you can do various things with them. You can do other plots with them. Um, you can, it makes it easy to spot outliers. Uh, and you can also send those selections to other tools, like for instance, DS9 or Aladdin. Uh, I won't demonstrate that probably today, but you can, that's another option. Um, so another uh, aspect of this linked views way of doing things, uh, of, of looking what a, a set of data in one place looks like in another context, is you can identify single points. So if you've got a plot here uh, and you click on one of the points, then uh, TopCat will tell you wh where that point is in, in other displays. So if you have other plots, it will show you where that point is. It will be highlighted in the other plots. And it will also show, so show you the row in the original table that that appears in it. So you can compare the various different values that it has. It's also possible to get that to uh, talk to other applications on the desktop, in this case, Aladdin. So what we've done here is, is click on this point and it highlights the points in other plots and also tells uh, Aladdin to point its all sky view to uh, that particular position on the sky. So that helps you understand uh, more of what's going on per object. One of the useful things it's got is an expression language, uh, which you can use to um, combine values in a table. So if you have, for instance, a uh, two magnitude columns, um, you might not want to plot those magnitude columns against each other. You might want to plot the color, the difference between those columns. Uh, and so you can use the expression language to uh, subtract one from the other. The expression language is pretty flexible. It's based on, well, it's actually Java syntax, but that's pretty much like C syntax, but that's uh, a fairly intuitive way uh, that you'd use in most programming languages. Um, so the idea is you use column names as variables. The columns in your tables become variables uh, and you, you manipulate those um, with things like normal arithmetic operators, plus minus divided by in times. Um, there are trigonometric functions and standard kind of mathematical functions. Conditional expressions can be quite useful. And then there's a number of um, uh, astronomically specific uh, functions as well that you can use in your expressions. Um, and so here's an example. If you've got a column called mag u and a column called mag g and you want to plot or add another column that's based on the difference, you just simply write mag u minus mag g, that's straightforward. Um, this is another one, Jansky to AB flux. So if you've got a column called flux, then there's a, a function in the, in the function library which converts from flux to AB magnitude. Uh, and this is a slightly more complicated example. The sky distance degrees one um, gives you an example, gives you an answer which is either true or false. So you can use it to define uh, a subset of rows, a selection of rows where the RA and DEC columns in the table are within 1.2 degrees of this particular sky position. So there's, there's pretty flexible things you can do with the expression language. Uh, visualization is one of the main things that TopCat does. Uh, I won't go through this in detail, but there are lots of different types of plot. Um, you can plot in 2D and 3D and uh, plots on the sky. And all these different plots have got many different options. Um, so you can change the colors and sizes and shapes of, of plot markers, change the color maps, uh, change the way that the data is represented if there are many, many points plotted on top of each other, um, different ways of representing points on the sky and so on, uh, contours, lots of different options. And all of these options, um, so it, it can be kind of complicated to get exactly the plot you want because there are so many different things that you can change, but the way it works, works is uh, there's always some sort of controls on the screen that you can use and you can move a slider or uh, type in a number or click buttons to, to toggle thing options on and off and the plot is immediately updated so as you change the controls you can see the plot changing uh, immediately as you do it and that makes it uh, as easy as it can be to, um, to fiddle around with the plot and get the uh, information that 
you want. And sometimes you do need to uh, play with it to understand the data that's in there. There's special attention played to large data sets. So one thing is that um, you will uh, plot many millions of rows without running out of memory. Um, another thing which I'll mention in a, in a minute is you can represent very dense plots. So if you have many, many points um, and you want to plot them in a way where you can understand what that's telling you rather than just seeing a, a sea of points on the screen, um, there are ways that it will help you to do that. Options for high dimension plotting, if you just have two columns, then uh, plotting a scatter plot is the obvious thing that you want to do. But if you have many more columns than that, then you can use the extra values to uh, plot in three dimensions or code points by color or code points by size or shape uh, or add little vector arrows to each point and so on to understand what's going on in more than two dimensions. Uh, and you can also export the uh, plots uh, in publication quality if you want to. Um, probably most people don't do that. I think most people use the data and understand what plots they want to make. Uh, and then when they decided what plot they want to make, most often people use some other tool like matplotlib in Python or IDL to uh, output the uh, publication quality pl plots for uh, putting in papers. But you can use Topcat output as well. I won't go through these in detail. This is just an example uh, of some of the kinds of plots you can do to give you an idea. Um, and this is what I was talking about when you're plotting very large numbers of points. So if you imagine that you have 10 million points that you want to plot, but you only have half a million pixels on the screen to plot them onto, uh, you can see that you may not get all the detail that you're interested in. So uh, this is kind of the obvious way to do such a plot um, where you just color in one pixel for, uh, for every value that you're trying to plot. Uh, and you can see the rough shape of what's going on, but you really can't see any structure in the overdense regions uh, in the middle here. And so Topcat gives you various different ways to do uh, these kinds of plots. These are all different ways that, that it offers you. One thing is doing uh, partially transparent points, and that gives you a bit better idea. But again, in, in the middle of the very dense regions and also in the very under dense regions, um, you can't see so much what's going on. Contour plots are useful for, for highly dense regions, but uh, you lose information about the outliers. Uh, something like a grid plot, this one here is a two dimensional histogram. So you can uh, divide up the screen into, uh, into square bins, rectangular bins and color each bin according to how many points fit in it. And that's a bit better, but you lose a bit of resolution in this case. And so by default, what Topcat gives you is, is this auto plot or density plot, where uh, if you look in the low density regions, it looks exactly like a scatter plot. But in the high density regions, it changes into uh, something more like a density plot, a 2D histogram, but without losing the resolution. And so these are ways that you can look at very large data sets and still make sense of them in terms of the high density regions, but also still see the outliers. Cross-matching is one of the jobs that, uh, that Topcat does. And so that's where you have, for instance, two catalogs in different um, frequencies and you want to work out which objects in one catalog correspond to which objects in another catalog, usually by looking at how close they are on the sky, but you can add other criteria as well. Um, and there's various ways that will help you to do that. The most obvious way is what's called an internal cross-match. So if you load two tables in Topcat, uh, you can uh, use, uh, use this window here, which lets you just say which tables you want to match together and you tell it which columns represent position uh, and then you give it some additional information about how to identify whether two rows are the same as each other and it just goes through and works out which objects correspond to which other ones and give you a new table. And this is a, a graphical representation. It's made of one of these cross matches here. So it's matched the pink objects with the, uh, the bluish ones uh, and done a line where it's identified a match. And some of these are single matches and in some cases there are uh, multiple matches. Um, that works if you can load both tables in, but if one of the tables is very large, uh, for instance, you want to cross match against the two mass catalog which is uh, half a billion rows. That's too large to load into Topcat uh, and too large to download. 
And so it gives you options to take an into a, a table that you've loaded, a smaller table, and um, somehow or other uh, talk to an external service in such a way that you can work out which objects are, uh, which objects in the external catalog correspond to which objects in the internal catalog. Um, I won't go through these details, but there's various different ways that you can do that for different profiles of whether you have large or small tables locally. Uh, I mentioned before the virtual observatory, um, that's uh, a term that some of you may have come across. If not, well, uh, to explain what it is, the, uh, if you imagine the uh, World Wide Web is a bit like having all uh, documents in the world sat on your computer where you can access them. The virtual observatory is a bit like having all astronomical archives in the world sat on your computer where you can access them. Uh, of course, that's not what is actually happening, but that's how it makes it look, at least that's the idea. What it actually is, is it's not a big uh, data warehouse with all the data in one place, but it's a set of protocols, which means that software clients like Topcat can talk to uh, data servers, astronomical archives in a consistent way. Uh, and that means that, uh, that Topcat can talk to many different data services uh, and retrieve the data in a way that that makes sense um, without you having to worry about the details of how that works. Uh, and so there's various different services that it can talk to. Cone search is uh, the most straightforward. It's where you just ask for catalog objects in a particular region of the sky. Table access protocol um, tap is much more powerful and that lets you write SQL like queries against uh, data archives, uh, against re remote relational databases. I'll give an example of those two uh, shortly. Um, and there are other options as well. Um, simple image access and simple spectral access let you acquire uh, image or, or spectrum data holdings, again, from external services in a particular region of the sky. There are some other ones like the CDS crossmatch service uh, and then service discovery uh, to find out where there are archives uh, which match their requirements that you've got. And SAMP is a, a slightly separate that allows tools to talk to each other on the desktop. So uh, allow Topcat to talk to DS9 or Aladdin or something like that. Just briefly, I'll mention Stilts. Um, so Stilts is a command line program, which has all the same capabilities as Topcat, but where Topcat is graphical and, and use a, a mouse and point and click Stilts, uh, you can write commands in, uh, in a scripting language at the shell uh, or possibly in Python, at least Jython. Um, and so TopCat is very good for interactively exploring data, uh, but if you have a table and you know what you want to do with it, or if you've got a thousand tables the same, and you know what you want to do with them, then you can write a, a little program in stilts which will do the same thing. So it's scriptable and reproducible. Um, and it also works with somewhat larger data sets. It, most things will work on unlimited size data sets than stilts. So I won't go into detail on that, but uh, if you're interested in scripting data, uh, that's also available and it's uh, documented uh, in the same way. So that's uh, more or less the end of the tour of the, of the capabilities. I haven't mentioned everything here. Um, there is uh, documentation for everything that I haven't mentioned. Um, and so if you go to the web page, you can find the manual in, in HTML. Uh, there's also this little uh, help button on every window. So if you're using Topcat and you don't understand how to do something or you uh, can see the controls and you can't make sense of them, click the help button and it will take you uh, in an internal viewer to the same, uh, to the right part of the manual uh, and it will explain how to do what you want to do. Uh, and uh, there's also support by email. So there's a mailing list uh, written here. And I'm also always happy to take questions by uh, a personal email to me. And as I say, it's very, uh, very useful to me to talk to users to work out uh, what problems they're having, what they want to do that doesn't work or, or to help them to use the software. Okay, so um, I'll now do a couple of demonstrations of this in action. Uh, so I'll start up Topcat, <clears throat> uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is to investigate some data about objects in the Pleiades. Uh, so that's a, a star cluster uh, relatively nearby to us. And I'm going to get data from um, 
a cone search query uh, using the uh, Gaia EDR3, uh, most recent data release of, of, from the Gaia satellite. So the first thing I do is to type in, uh, to open this, this, uh, this cone search window here, I go into the VO menu and push cone search button. Um, and type in Gaia EDR3 and push the find services. So what this then does is go to the uh, VO registry uh, and say, uh, can you find me any services which provide cone search functionality and which have Gaia and EDR3 somewhere in their, uh, in the description of the service. EDR is early data release three, that's the recent data release. And so there's these four, uh, they all work one way or another. I'm going to choose the first one, which is from a server in Heidelberg. So that uh, identifies which service I want to talk to. And then I type in Pleiades here, which says where I want to look on the sky. It goes to another server to work out what sky position the Pleiades sits at. And I would like all the objects within one degree uh, of that position. And I push OK. So then this goes off to this server in Heidelberg and downloads all the sky objects which are uh, in the Gaia EDR3 source catalogue uh, within one degree of this sky position. And you can see it's downloading them here. Um, I'll just say, by the way, that the, the demonstration I'm going through here, hopefully it will give you an idea of the sorts of things that Topcat can do. Um, it's probably too far for you to follow along with, but I'll give you a URL at the end which... Um, which gives a description of the um, of the steps that I've been going through. So if you want later on to follow it on or see in more detail what I've been doing, or you can't remember how I did uh, some of the things, then uh, you can go to that description and it gives you a step-by-step -step, uh, description of how to do all these things. So it's downloading here. Uh, I think there are about 27,000 rows, so we're nearly there. Okay, so it's downloaded this table here. Uh, you can see it in the list of loaded tables. And if I click this button, I can see that data and scroll around a bit. There's uh, all those rows and columns. Um, and then I can make various visualizations. So the first thing I can do is uh, make a sky plot. And you can see I asked for a cone, so it's a, a cone-sized area, circle area on the celestial sphere. Uh, and that's, uh, that's where it is. That looks reasonable. Uh, and you can zoom in and out quickly. I'm just using the mouse buttons to do that. Um, and each of these points is, is one object. There are lots of different kinds of plots you can do. So one thing I'll do is uh, add a, a vector plot here. Um, so what I'm going to do is represent the uh, velo velocities of these, oh, uh, excuse me, just a bit of trouble with the mouse, represent the velocities of these objects as well as their positions. Uh, so I'm going to draw a little arrow based on the proper motions. So if I choose proper motion RA and proper motion declination the arrow dimensions and zoom in then these little arrows uh, describe how the each of these objects is moving across the sky and you can see some of them moving down here some are moving uh, th this way some are not moving at all as you zoom in you can see uh, a tiny motion arrow so that's a, a, another way of, of visualizing more information about these objects and what i'm now going to do is plot the uh, the proper motions themselves on a separate graph so oops. so this time uh, I'm plotting on a, a 2d uh, graph not a sky graph um, the proper motion in right ascension versus the proper motion in declination let me zoom in um, and what you can see here is that there are two subpopulations um, of uh, in this proper motion space. And so uh, because this is a, a proper motion graph, the, uh, the objects which are close to each other are ones which are moving with a uh, similar velocity across the sky. As you can see, most of the objects are in this, uh, this background group with uh, velocity with a 
that are clustered more or less around zero. They're not moving much, but there's this uh, very distinct subpopulation here, which are moving across the sky with, with a, a well-defined velocity. And these are uh, members of a cluster. They all formed at the same time. And so they all have similar motion. And so you can see the same proper motion for all of them. So what I'm now going to do is identify these as a, uh, as a subgroup by drawing uh, a blob around them. Uh, and so I say, these are the ones that I'm interested in. Click this again, and then give that selection a name. I'll call it uh, cluster. So these are the actual members of the Pleiades cluster, and these other ones are, are background objects. You can see these are now colored in blue. If I go back to the sky plot, you can see that the, uh, the blue objects all have, I can turn off the background objects, so all these blue objects have got uh, proper motions which are pretty much the same as each other. They're all moving kind of down and to the left uh, with about the same uh, magnitude. Uh, and that's the same as saying they sit on the same region of this graph here. Uh, and if I turn the background objects again, you can see that those are moving all over the place, but the blue ones are all moving in the same direction. So having got that, um, we've actually identified objects in the cluster and we can do some useful things with it. One thing we can do is to plot a histogram of the uh, parallaxes of these objects. Gaia measures parallax as well as um, proper motions and, and position. So if I use parallax here and I'm just interested in the, for, in, in the cluster objects, not the foreground objects, not not the background objects. Um, so you can see this is the uh, parallaxes of the objects in the cluster. And they're clustered around seven point something, uh, about 7.35 uh, arc seconds. So what that's telling us is that um, the objects in the, uh, in the Pleiades in this cluster um, all have a, a parallax, which is quite similar, which is about 7.3 um, milli arc seconds. Uh, and so if we invert that, just divide it, uh, divide one by, it, um, you can, what that's telling us is that the, the objects in the Pleiades cluster are about 130 um, kiloparsec away from us. So we've done a, a, a useful bit of uh, uh, distance measurement by just looking at these proper motions and, and taking sub selections. Um, what's I going to do next? Oh yes, yeah, so I can also plot a, a color magnitude diagram. So in Gaia, we have the uh, G magnitudes and also uh, BP minus RP. So these are, uh, this is a, let me turn this upside down. As you can see, there's various different uh, configuration options you can make of the plot. Um, and so if I look at this, this is a color magnitude diagram uh, in, of all the objects in red uh, and they're you know, kind of scattered around. But if you look at just the blue objects, distinct from the background objects, you can see that they're, uh, they're clustered quite nicely into a main sequence. And that's because all these objects in the Pleiades are in the same cluster. They were formed at the same time. They have similar characteristics. Um, and the background objects are all over the place, so they, they don't fit on a nice uh, main sequence in the color magnitude diagram. Uh, so that's uh, looking at the Gaia photometry. One other thing we can do is if we want to look at some other photometry, um, for instance, compare it with two mass photometry, infrared uh, photometry for the same objects, um, I can do a, a subsequent search. So what I'm going to do now is look for objects which are uh, counterparts of these, uh, but observed by two mass. And for this, I'm going to use this, this CDS upload X match service. And this is one of these two match, uh, sorry, uh, cross match, uh, services, which will talk to an external service, uh, and, um, find me objects, which are in, uh, another catalog, uh, which isn't on my computer, but it's elsewhere. And this is a service run by Strasbourg. Uh, so uh, I identify that I want to look at, at two mass objects. Uh, these are the, this is the table that I have locally. Uh, and I'm only interested in the objects in the cluster that I identified. And so I push go. And so it sends my cluster objects to Strasbourg in France. 
that does some calculations and very quickly sends me back some results. And so it's found uh, 400 odd objects, um, which are both in two mass and in this cluster here. And if I look at the columns that I get back from that table, uh, these down to here are the columns that I identified from the initial Gaia catalog. Uh, and these ones down here are objects, uh, are columns that it's added on uh, with two mass photometry for those same objects because it's found objects that are close in two mass to the ones I gave it. And now I've got that, I can do another color, di color magnitude diagram or a color color diagram. So I can plot here uh, the same color that I had before, BP minus RP in, uh, in optical from Gaia. Um, and then I have these quantities, oops. I have uh, J, H and K magnitudes um, from two mass. I'm gonna use the expression language to you to plot J mass, sorry, J mag minus K mag. So this is a JK color, uh, uh, an infrared color here versus an optical color here. And you can see this is a different color color diagram. You can see interestingly, there are some outliers. So this is, again is a sequence that makes sense, but these ones here, uh, there's probably something wrong with them. They're background objects or outliers for some reason. And it'd be interesting to see why they are. So uh, what I can do is open up the, uh, the data window here. And if I click on one of these objects, um, it will take me to the row of the data which corresponds to that object. Uh, and if I go along here, I can see this is some sort of quality flag and this object here has got UUE, uh, which means something like the, there are problems with the photometry. If I click on one of the ones in, in the main sequence, I get AAA, which means the photometry is good. But down here I get UUE, which means the photometry is bad. So it's not surprising that this one is an outlier that's already known in the two mass catalog. If I want to see something even more detailed about that, I can look at the actual, uh, uh, an image corresponding to the two mass uh, observation of that. Um, I won't go through in detail what I'm doing here, but what I'm uh, gonna do is make top cat plot the, um, plot the, uh, display the two mass image for each object that I click on. So if I click on one of these here now, it should go to uh, another service and show me the actual two mass uh, image that corresponds to that object. So I can click on different ones and it gives me different pictures. Um, and if I click on, uh, let's see this one again. Uh, so there you are, you can, you can see this is the object uh, that corresponds to this chap here. And the photometry is obviously compromised because it's next to another very bright star. So um, using these different ways of, of drilling down into the data uh, and looking at individual points uh, and looking at what their uh, values are in the main catalog, looking at other plots and looking at, um, at data, uh, image data, which has come from them. Um, you can find out a lot about the objects and understand the, the, what you're looking at in the plots. Okay, so uh, I'll do one uh, shorter example now, uh, which is similar, but using a different data access service. Let me clear out some of these windows. Um, so this time I'm gonna use uh, TAP, which is a table access protocol. It's a more complicated data access uh, service, but it can do more complicated things. So I'm gonna ask for TAP services uh, relating to Gaia again, uh, and I'll use this one. This is the main Gaia data access uh, server um, at ITAC in Spain. Um, and so this is gonna tell me um, what tables I can look at in this service and what kinds of queries I can do on them. So here we have a list of, of the different uh, sets of data, the different data schemas um, from this Gaia service. This one is Gaia EDR3, Gaia Early Data Release 3, the most recent one. And the table I'm interested in here is this one, Gaia EDR3.data.gaia source. So this is the Gaia source catalog. If I click here, it tells me what the table is. It's got 99 columns. 
um, it's got data for every Gaia source uh, and it's got 1.8 billion rows. I look here, it tells what the columns are uh, and there's quite a few of them and as well as the column names, uh, it tells me uh, units and, and a description of each of them and some other information as well. Now the query I'm gonna make uh, is slightly complicated have an idea, but basically I'm getting some columns um, from this source catalog, this Gaia EDR3 source catalog, where the objects have a high parallax and the parallax is reliable and they have radial velocities. So what that means is show me what the velocities are in three dimensional space. It doesn't directly uh, have the X, Y, and Z um, components of the 3D velocity, but that's what I'm going to try to get. And so I can do that using one of the functions in the expression language. This lists the functions in the expression language. Uh, so for instance, down here, it shows me uh, that you can calculate cosines and, uh, and arc tangents and so on. But the function that I want for this is uh, this one, a Strom UVW. And this calculates from the different components, RA, DEC, uh, and parallax, and proper motions, and radial velocity. It will calculate a three-dimensional vector giving the velocity in, in, uh, in Cartesian space. So I'll use this function to add a new column uh, to the data table that I've downloaded. Uh, if I can find it. So what I'm going to do now is go to this columns window and add a new column uh, to the list of columns. I'll call it UVW. And again, I'll copy the expression from the slides, which is this. So this is the expression in the expression language, uh, which means please calculate me three dimensional velocity from the information that I've got. And it's going to be in kilometers per second. And if I now look at the uh, data table, I can see as well as the columns that I downloaded, I've also got this new column UVW, which is a, a three dimension, uh, three element vector, X, Y, and Z velocity. And I can then plot these in three dimensional space. Uh, the zero first and second component of that velocity vector. So what we have here in, in three dimensions is um, the uh, position. So this is the, the three dimension analog of the uh, proper motion plot that I did for the Pleiades. Uh, and this is all the objects near the solar system uh, in three dimensional velocity space. And you can see there's some structure here. There's a little bit of layering. Uh, you might be able to see that on your screen. So there's a kind of gap there. So that's some, something to do with the structure of the, of the velocity space uh, near here. But also there's this over density here, this little knot of objects. Uh, and what this is, is the Hyades. It's the most prominent object in 3D, 3D velocity space uh, near us. Um, and they're delocalized on the sky because the cluster is quite close, but they're quite localized in velocity space. And so I can do the same sort of thing. I can identify uh, just these objects and call them Hyades and then go back and uh, plot on the sky <clears throat> where those objects sit. Again, let's make the background. So that's where the Hyades are on the sky, these objects which are uh, identified in three-dimensional velocity space. Uh, and you can see them on an all sky plot as well. So that's another example of uh, downloading a data set um, working out uh, by looking at some characteristic of them, which ones are in a particular uh, region of space and then plotting uh, those objects in a different context to, to see what's going on. Okay, so that's all the, uh, that is all the demonstrations that I wanted to give. Let's go back to the presentation.
Okay, so that, that's about the end of what I wanted to say. Um, just to wind up, if you're interested in looking at what I've just done in a bit more detail, uh, you can find this, uh, this URL here, goes through the tutorial, those things, uh, and some additional uh, tutorial exercises that you can play around with as well, which will help you to learn how to use it. Um, if you want to use the program, go to these URLs, uh, and that tells you the uh, that will give you downloads and also documentation and other information. There's more tutorial information there as well. Uh, and as I say, there's the mailing list, and uh, and I'm happy to receive questions by email as well. Uh, and of course, I'd be very happy to answer any questions you've got now. So thank you very much indeed for your uh, attention. I hope it hasn't been too intense. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>